Ellen White Reconsidered, a series of presentations for people with questions about Ellen White's writings. Today's presentation is The Source of Ellen White's Visions. Welcome. I'm Pastor Kevin Morgan. We're back again with another episode, and what we want to talk about today is the source of Ellen White's visions. That's a pretty important part for our understanding because uh, people have a lot of explanations for it, and we're going to consider the four basic ones today. In doing so, I want to remind you of something that uh, I heard for, about physicians in training. That's what this stethoscope is here to remind me about. When they're trying to diagnose an illness, they are told, when you hear the sound of hoofbeats, think of horses and not of zebras. And what this is trying to say is that most of the illnesses that are presented when a, a patient comes to a doctor's office fall within the common explanations. And th that most things are going to be covered by a very simple explanation. But there are zebras. So what are those explanations? Well, the first of those is that her visions are the result of religious reveries that are based on her previous thought and study. Kind of like what we have when we have dreams sometimes, things that we've been thinking about come together in an, a, a, some kind of a dream that may try to make sense of, of the things that we have experienced or thought about. But does that really explain what she went through in a vision? Does it tell us, explain to us, how that she would know things in advance of being told about them? Let's consider the testimony of Daniel T. Bordeaux. How interesting and wonderful it was to hear Sister White correctly delineate the peculiarities of different fields she had seen only as the Lord had shown them to her and show how they should be met to hear her describe case after case of persons she had never seen with her natural vision, and either point out their errors or show important relations they sustained to the cause, and how they should connect with it to better serve its interests. As I had a fair chance to test the matter, having been on the ground, and knowing that no one had informed Sister White of these things, while serving as an interpreter, I could not help exclaiming, it is enough. I want no further evidence of its genuineness. Bordeaux, who served as an interpreter there in Europe when she visited in the 1880s, recognized that what she was sharing from her vision was not something that she had been told by somebody else. It was prescient. And in many other instances, we have evidences that she has insight into things that nobody could have told her. She tells the story in advance of the story. What's the next explanation? Well, some folks said that she was mesmerized, and this explanation deals with the physical phenomena that sometimes accompanied her visions, particularly in the early days. They saw that she seemed to be entering an altered state, and so they explained that that was the reason why she was having visions. There were people who had this view who were able to check out their assumptions. They were able to see her in vision and to examine her to see if that explanation held water. Consider the witness statement of Dr. Merritt G. Kellogg. Sister White was in vision about 20 minutes or half an hour. As she went into vision everyone present seemed to feel the power and presence of God, and some of us did indeed feel the Spirit of God resting upon us mightily. We were engaged in prayer and social meeting Sabbath morning at about nine o'clock. Brother White, my father, and Sister White had prayed, and I was praying at the time. There had been no excitement, no demonstrations. We did plead earnestly with God, however, that He would bless the meeting with His presence, and that He would bless the work in Michigan. As Sister White gave that triumphant shout of, Glory! 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 which you have heard her give so often as she goes into vision, Brother White arose and informed the audience that his wife was in vision. After stating the manner of her visions, and that she did not breathe while in vision, he invited anyone who wished to do so to come forward and examine her. Dr. Drummond, a physician, 
who was also a first-day Adventist preacher, who, before he saw her in vision, had declared her visions to be of mesmeric origin, and that he could give her a vision, stepped forward, and after a thorough examination, turned very pale, and remarked, she doesn't breathe. So who was Drummond? Drummond was a physician at the time of the vision in the 1850s, but back in the 1840s, he had preached with Elder Cornell as an Advent minister. And now he was in this area and, and, and apparently had some curiosity. He wasn't the only one to ever examine her in vision. Several other doctors did, as well as other lay people who were able to see her in vision and see that what she was experiencing was not something she could control and was not something that they could control either. George I. Butler, whose father had been one of the earliest of Adventists and he had been a child in the early days of the movement, described what others were able to see over the course of several years. For nearly 30 years past these visions have been given with greater or less frequency, and have been witnessed by many, oftentimes by unbelievers as well as those believing them. They generally, but not always, occur in the midst of earnest sessions of religious interest while the Spirit of God is specially present, if those can tell who are in attendance. The time Mrs. White is in this condition has varied from 15 minutes to 180. During this time the heart and pulse continue to beat, the eyes are always wide open, and seem to be gazing at some far distant object, and are never fixed on any person or thing in the room. They are always directed upward. They exhibit a pleasant expression. There is no ghastly look or any resemblance of fainting. The brightest light may be suddenly brought near her eyes, or faints made as if to thrust something into the eye. And there is never the slightest wink or change of expression on that account. And it is sometimes hours, and even days after she comes out of this condition before she recovers her natural sight. She says it seems to her that she comes back into a dark world, yet her eyesight is in no wise injured by her visions. Butler goes on to explain that when she's in vision, she is unconscious of the world around her and what people are doing around her. And in fact, they don't get any response from her when she's in vision, no matter what they have done. Under hypnosis, people are highly subjected to suggestion, and people can sometimes get people to do odd things when they're in vision, but she is acting independently of anyone around her. Therefore, it is not a hypnosis that is happening to her at the time. Well, is there anything else that we could consider? Recently, several have suggested that what she was experiencing was frontal lobe epilepsy. And the reason why they suggest this is because of some vague similarities of those that have been uh, subject to epileptic fits in the, of this sort. But her repetition of glory, 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 as she goes into vision and dark, dark, as she's coming out, are not like the experiences of those who repeat nonsense words and their expressions are just weird. People who have epilepsy and anyone that has been around people with epilepsy know that epileptics are highly embarrassed by the experiences because they're out of control. If people are successful at all that have epilepsy, it isn't because of the epilepsy, it is in spite of the epilepsy. And the epilepsy does not explain how that she could have visions that made perfect sense. These are not like dreams that are odd and weird things out of line. Her visions are insightful and they are forward thinking and they just make good sense. So that exhausts the first three explanations and those horses don't line up. There's something beyond that. And recognizing as we've gone along that there is something beyond the physical, beyond the control of Ellen White, or beyond the control of somebody trying to manipulate her, there is something that is supernatural. And so some people, exhausting the possibilities of the natural, 
and not willing to accept the messages that Ellen White has presented because of some personal interpretation of prophecy or doctrine, or because she points out some error in their lives that they don't want to acknowledge, they are willing to say that her visions came from the devil. Now, this is not something new because in the time of Jesus, people did the same thing about him. I'm not trying to say that she's on par with Jesus, but I'm just saying that people are willing to accuse somebody something of something so heinous simply because their own heart, their own mind, limits them from being able to recognize what is taking place. And when they did it to Jesus, what did he say? He said, if the devil casts out the devil, how could his kingdom stand? Now, people want to accuse her of the worst of things. But even some of her worst critics acknowledged that she was a godly woman. There were people outside of the Advent faith who recognized that she was a woman that had positive things in her life and that she was very sincere and and devout and that she trusted the bible and that she upheld jesus and that there were good fruits in her life so how is it possible when she's directing somebody to change their lives for the better to bring them into harmony with heaven that they would consider that of the devil i think the answer is that we need to analyze our own motivations. We could look into the lives of many different people who rejected her ministry. In some cases, they went on to be productive Christians like Joshua Himes, Welcome Damon, others that chose not to listen to some of her counsel for one reason or another, and whose lives uh, became negative in their direction and that they spent the rest of their lives fighting her or uh, they had sad outcomes in their lives some of the people are not pictured here jesse stevens who she tried to to speak to the prophet's labor of speaking to people about hidden things in their lives is not an easy job it wasn't something she relished. She said on a number of occasions she wished she could give it up. But God had called her and she was faithful. And people misunderstood what she was trying to do. People thought she was just being picky when she was actually rather magnanimous and she was generous. There's incidents that we hear stories about her life. Somebody was coming to the house and they didn't have any white bread at the house and the person liked white bread and she said by all means go get some even though she was into health she recognized that people are different she sent messages to people one late young lady she said if i didn't think there was hope for you i wouldn't be spending time trying to share this with you her counsels are redemptive when she spoke to dm canwright it was like a loving mother talking to a son when her own son had gotten into business and separated himself from the work of the church and was busy doing other things, sometimes not very successfully, she wrote over and over again, son, God has a purpose for you. It's much higher than just business. And when he finally got it, then he recognized that Jesus was his savior and that he had a purpose the previous efforts that he had made in publishing and building boats, some of his business adventures became the very thing that he used to reach people down in the depths of Mississippi. Could it be that God is trying to reach you through those writings? Maybe there's a message for you to change your life for the better and to give you a sense of purpose. I'll be praying for you. God bless you and have a great day.